Okay. So we're continuing our review. Um, hopefully last time's review of since the first part of the class was helpful. And uh, I don't know if you have any questions on the review or on the material that we covered, which is basically references, dividing conquer, dynamic programming, 3D algorithms, and some network flows. Today I'm going to cover the rest, so what I would consider the more advanced material, um, randomization, optimization, linear programming, and real approximation. So I think we'll start with some review of things in randomness, and I think um, what I would like to do today is maybe start off with just a you know, reminder of all the basic tools of the trade you need to be comfortable with. So, you know, remember when we talk about probabilities, we always talk about the probability of some event. An event is something that either happens or doesn't happen, right? Um, that's, it's a small thing, but it can often be confusing because a, a, a die roll is not an event. The die roll being a six is an event. A coin toss is not an event. A coin toss being heads is an event. So these are small things, but they often, I find, trip people up when you're trying to articulate what is it you're trying to do. And you get confused between events and random variables and expectations and things like that. So it's helpful to keep those things in mind. Right? Okay. So we have events, the basic object of study in a randomized algorithm is an event. And then probabilities, and you have probabilities of events, right? Um, then the next thing that happens is that you have random variables, right? So a random variable, x, is informally a mapping from events to numbers, right? If I say that, oh, this random variable is 1 if the coin tosses heads, that's a random variable, it's getting actual value, right? But I can also say this coin toss is 53. Uh, the, the value of the random variable is 53 if the coin toss is heads. That's also acceptable. So you know, even if you have the same set of events, you can define different kinds of random variables on them. That's really our game. So random variable is just a way to just map from events to actual numbers. Okay? And sometimes you, they might map from events to other things as well. So you may not map from events to numbers, you could map from events to other structured objects. But generally, we've seen mostly random variables with our values. Okay. Now, a probability distribution, right, is is basically an assignment of values to all events, all possible events, right? So, a probability distribution. And again, I'm, I'm I'm using this in a very discrete language, which is acceptable for most of the problems we'll do. There's a continuous version of all these things as well. Uh, in, in a continuous sense, I would say it's a function mapping events to probabilities with certain rules and how they apply. Um, but you can think this also discrete. So a probability distribution on events is basically talking okay, each event has a certain probability and there are rules. Like the union of two events will have a probability that's at most the sum of the two things and so on. Just like set continuous things. Um, and so, you know, for example, if I have an, you know, I have, again I have this die roll. The probability distribution of that role is the probability of various events. Well, if it's a six-sided die, you have six events, you can assign probabilities to all of them. They might be the same, they might not be. It doesn't, you know, that's not the point. So I might say, you know, so die roll equal to one, two, three, four, five, six. This may be one sixth, one sixth, one sixth, one third, one third, zero. This is a perfectly reasonable probability distribution on the die rolls, right? Because it all adds up to one, which is what you need. Right? And every individual event has a problem. Okay. And then once we have events and property distributions and random variables, now we can talk about expected expectation. So the expected value of a random variable needs all the things we just decided, right? So first of all, what value it takes on an event and what the probability of an event is. So it's summation x equal to i, um, well, sorry, summation i times the probability that x equal to i, right? And again, I wrote as a summation, you might think of it as an integral, okay? Expectation is an average. What is the most, what is the outcome on average? In our example up there, you know, um, you can compute the expected value up here to be 
1 over 6 plus 2 over 6 plus 3 over 6 plus 4 over 3 plus 5 over 3. Um, that's 1 plus, so this is basically 4. So the expected value of the dice when you roll it will be four. Okay. And of course the variance of a random variable is the expected value of its deviation from its mean. <coughs> Square deviation because we're only worried about the magnitude. Right. So again, if x is a random variable, e of x is a constant, so x minus e of x is also a random variable. So that's a random variable, then therefore x, x minus e x squared is also a random variable. So everything's good, we have a random variable inside, and we want to compute expected value. So just like we did before, we'd write this as, you know, it's equal to the summation of um, i minus e of x whole squared, probability x equal to i. And you can compute this for this case as well. And this, is, you know. and this is basic fact that the variance of x, this is a basic identity, is equal to the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x whole squared. I didn't make me mention this in class, but this is a very standard identity. It's not hard to prove this. For entertainment, you might try to prove it yourself, and the basic way to prove it is to just literally expand out that thing. And once you expand it, you need to use one more property, property that we've used often. The property we've used often is linearity of expectation. And the way to write this is that the expected value of ax plus by is equal to a times the expected value of x plus b times the expected value of y. This is the most general form of what you call linear of expectations. You can add two random variables and it, it composes over that, or you can multiply a random variable by a scalar value and it composes over that. It is the most general form of this. So using only this and this, you can prove this. It's not very hard to prove. Just plug it in and do the algebra. Okay, so in terms of basic probability, um, that is mostly what we covered. We also made some other observations that the x, the you know, um, the let's see, that the probability of the union of a bunch of events. So that a bunch of events, and I have an or of them, essentially saying, you know, can any of them occur? This can be written as or upper bounded by the sum of each of the events. Okay. And the Venn diagram, the way to think of this the Venn diagram is this is one event, this is another event, this is another event. We're looking at the probability of the union of events, so looking at the volume of essentially the union of all these regions. Well, that's definitely going to be less than equal to the volume of each of these regions because we're ignoring all the intersections. But this is still correct. It doesn't matter how these variables interact. This is always going to be true. Okay. Um, and of course, interaction captures this idea of non-independence, right? If things are, um, well, that's not quite true. But independence is another notion. And we say that two variables are independent. If um, If the probability of x equal to i and y equal to j is equal to the probability of x equal to i times the probability of y equal to j for all i and j. So again, I wrote this in a very discrete language. You can think of x taking on values as some random variable, y taking on some values. And what we're saying is that the joint probability of these two things happening is equal to the product of the individual probabilities. Right? It's like saying I have a matrix of probabilities so that I can fill in all the entries by looking at the values here and the values here and multiplying them on. In general, that may not be the case, but if it, if it does happen, then they're called independent. Independence because 
to evaluate this joint probability, I don't need to look at any interaction between them. I just look separately what they're looking at. Right? The probability of um, me walking in that direction and you know another professor walking to the left at the same time in another direction are presumably independent unless we are quantumly entangled. Let's pretend we're not. So, but for the most part, these are independent things. Right? But the probability of me going that way and then coming that way, you know, it, well, that, that, that seems to be a joint correlative thing. Right? But for that way, I'm going to come back this way. So, and the way you define is this, and the way you evaluate is this. Are, is, in fact, the joint probability equal to the probability of the difference? And why that's important is because when you have independence, you can see a little bit more that if x and y are independent, then var of x um, plus y is equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y. So for expectation, linearity holds regardless. For variance, not quite. You have done this extra thing. Okay. And uh, as a separate matter, it's not too hard to show that the variance of a times x would be a squared times the variance of x. Why? Because you have to do the square of things, which at least it's scaled up. Okay. So there's all basic facts about probability, and it will it'll be beneficial to you to keep this in your mind. Because in general, when we start looking at actually analyzing randomized algorithms, we're going to need all these things. And we'll just throw them in. Okay. And remember there are two kinds of randomized algorithms. There are we get now, so now let's get to actual randomized algorithms. There are two kinds. What is the first kind of randomized algorithm? What properties does it guarantee? And there are two kinds. So give me one kind. What, what, when you have a when you implement a randomized algorithm, what kind of guarantees do you typically expect to see? Or give me one kind of guarantee you expect to see. Time and time. So what does that mean? We say time with it. So tracks like you run it for a, a fixed number of steps and you take the result as it. And then what, what guarantee are you getting that? So you can say that you have an answer, a good good enough answer up at at a finite uh, time. Can you say more? But that we said every algorithm. If we run it for a good enough answer. Only more or less that you can say what a random algorithm. I can't just Sorry? Like, even is, as in a regular linear form, so, you'd expect a. I see, I hear words, but I don't hear a sentence. Can you determine this? Because I'm guessing an implementation should have a. You should spend more time than an no, no, no. That's not. These are these are these are the sort of metaphorical statements one can make about what we like about randomization. I'm asking you something specific. A concrete statement you make. You run it for a certain time, you get an answer, and you say what? So in one case, time is deterministic, and it's so let's talk about the first case. Yeah, in in the first case, time is deterministic. And what happens then? But in that case, you uh, uh, like we would be able to know that this algorithm would only take this much amount of time, but we cannot really uh, uh, guarantee that the algorithm would be exact. But what do you think? So that's an approximation. Algorithm. Yes, so the probability of getting the correct answer is not one. Thank you. Is, uh, okay. So fixed time. The probability of correctness is less than one, but hopefully more than half. That's one kind of algorithm. What's the other kind? Running for infinite time. Infinite time. You have a lot of time. So if you're long enough and a, that's not what we say. That's not what the promise is. It's something different. I mean, kind of, but not quite. There's a better way of saying it. So you don't bound your number of steps. Uh, you don't? What is the other kind? That the time is fixed, but the probability of correctness is fixed. What is the probability of correctness? It's fixed some defined threshold. 
It's actually one. It's always correct. But the time is not fixed. That seems unsatisfying. Can you say anything about the time? <coughs> oh, yeah. So I thought what to say, oh, well, you know, it'll run, whatever. But it always could be correct. I, mean, I have plenty of algorithms I can collect. <laughs> they'll run for whatever you return times. Something more than that. So we did say it's sort of always correct. Okay. But this, we're sacrificing something, right? So time somehow is fluctuating, but what can we say about the time? It doesn't fluctuate too much. There's something we can say about the running time. <coughs> I wish to run the algorithm. I know the algorithm is partly correct. And I'm going to keep running it like get the answer. I know it'll, if it says yes, it's, I'm sure it'll say yes. But I don't know when that'll happen. So I just keep running it until it says yes. What what kind of algorithm? This is an algorithm that will always give the answer, will be the correct answer, but it's fluctuating. But what can I say? Yes, so the expected running time is fixed, like it's finite. It's bounded. It's bounded. Okay. Expected running time is bounded. Remember, running time is, if you're saying that the algorithm just runs as long as it needs to run and it's randomized, then the running time is a random variable. If the running time is a random variable, then there is a notion of the expected value of the random variable, and that's what we're guaranteeing here. It's expected running time is polynomial. Okay? If you run quick sort with random pivots, it's expected running time is n log n. Okay? This is the other kind. Most of the algorithms we've studied have been the first kind. Where you have a fixed amount of time and you have some probability of error and then you do amplification or whatever. But the second kind is also important because you guarantee correctness. It's kind of cool. But it might take a bit longer. And we've also talked about how you might go from one to the other. How you take an algorithm of the first kind. If you know the algorithm runs in some time and has a probability of correctness two thirds, okay? How do I convert it to an algorithm? Let's assume also, which is important, that when it gives me an answer, I can tell if it's correct or not. <laughs> How do I convert it to a number in the second time? What do I do? We've talked about this conversion. So I give an algorithm that runs in time t, it spits out an answer. The answer may or may not be correct, the probability will be correct is two thirds, and I can tell if it's correct or not. What do I do? Converted to the second one. Yeah. Uh, I think multiplication. But in this particular case, what does that mean? Uh, I just write it until you get the correct answer. So then, what can you say about? Can you give it? So if you run it until it gives the correct answer, it will eventually give you the correct answer. So that second quality property is satisfied. How do you guarantee the first one? That is, running time is bound. Uh, by the probability distribution. Well, how do I do that? I mean, I, I told you that the probability would be correct is two thirds. I told you it takes time t to run one iteration. What is my expected running time? So, how do you even set up this question? You're saying I have a random variable. So random variable is running time. So in order to compute the expected value of the random variable, I need the probability distribution of the random variable. In order to find the probability distribution of the random variable, I need to know how long it takes to run for k steps, or k plus one step, or k plus two steps. So, can I say that? So, if the <coughs> <if> procedure <coughs> takes time t and is correct with probability two thirds, what is the probability that I have to run it r times to be correct? What is the probability that I'll be r, r in step, the answer you get is correct, but not before? You have everything you need to know. What do you do?
Anyone? Yep. I, I will compute the probability that I get the wrong answer. Then I amplify. Then I, at the end, I check the. No, that's fine. But you're good. Give me, give me, tell me. Like, like, I need, I need, I need numbers. So what is the? Sorry. What is the probability that I've run it r times to get the right answer? For some value. Uh, r has time one third. Sorry. One minus. Uh, one third to the power of r. One minus one third to the power of r. Explain. Because the uh, wrong for, for one. What's that? The wrong probability. Probability that I get the incorrect answer is one third. Yeah. And amplify it. R times. Then probability of getting the wrong answer after R times is. Ah, okay. I said, what is the problem? You have to run it R times to get the correct answer, which means you're not running, you're not getting it wrong R times. You're okay. getting it wrong R minus one times, and you're getting it correct one time. So after R times, the problem of getting wrong answer is one third. Yes, but that's not the event I'm looking for. And then I check, check one minus. That's not the event you're looking for, right? Because the event you're constructing is the pro is the complement of the event. That you get it wrong r times. What is the complement of the event that you get it wrong r times? It is the event that you don't get it wrong r times, which means you get it right the first time, you get it right the second time, you get it right the third time, you get it right the fourth time, or the fifth, or the sixth, or the seventh, or sixth, seventh, and eighth. None of those is the thing I want to find. So you did not compute the property of the right event. What is the property of this event? That you get it right on the r. 1 minus 3 raised to power r minus 1 times 1 by 3. Say it again. One divided, 1 divided by 3 raised to power r minus 1 times 1 by 3. That's 1 by 3. Times 2 by 3. Success. This is the probability that on the first r minus 1 trial you fail, and on the r trial you succeed. Okay, so now we know that the probability that the running time, which we'll call x, uh, well, the number of iterations, which we'll call x, is equal to r, is equal to this. So what is the expected value of x? The expected value of x is equal to the sum from r equal to 1 to infinity of 1 by 3 to the r minus 1 times 2 by 3 times r. Yes? Is that right? Um, which is equal to We're having a one page cheat sheet will be helpful you will be helpful for you because these kinds of summations are there's a formula for them. Um, and you could try to derive it, but that'll be a waste of time. You could just know the answer to this. Um, let me see if I remember the answer. My, I'm I'm lazy to derive it every time I'm done. I don't have a ticket time to exam. So. Um, uh, the answer to this is going to be something like So in general, we have a summation of the form. Um, R times alpha to the R. And OK, let's do this. Let's try um, R equal to Then alpha times S is equal to sigma r times alpha to the r plus 1, r to the minus 3, and then s minus alpha s is equal to, uh, equal to 6 
Therefore, S is equal to 1 over 1 minus 1. And if you ever seen a strict before, but some issues like this is what you do. So I'm not asking you to derive these strings in your exam. This is the kind of thing it's good to have as a memory manager for so on and so on. <coughs> Once you do that, you now have computed the expected value, which is S, and you're done. You just plug in the value of alpha. In this case, alpha is equal to 1 over 3. So alpha is equal to 1 over 3. So this is how you can convert from fixed to expected. If you have to convert from expected running time to fixed, what do you do? And again, under the appropriate conditions where it makes sense to say you know, it runs at every step it's, it's running, but you can let's assume we can stop at any point so we can give you what you want so far. Right? Um, then Can you go from the second to the first? Because this will bring us to another trick that we often use, that we find important to use in random migration. So how do you go from, and by the way, I forgot to mention this. I mean, I did mention this before, but not here. This is called Las Vegas. And this is called Monte Carlo. So we've talked about to go from Monte Carlo to Las Vegas. If you want to go from Las Vegas to Monte Carlo, and yes, I know you're to fly to get there, Apart from that, how do you convert the last Vegas algorithm? So one that is guaranteed to be correct, but its running time varies, into one that has a fixed running time, but has some probability of being correct. How would you convert? And again, this doesn't always work, but it can. What do you do? We talked about this. And I will give you a hint. You need to use a tail inequality of time. Think of some of the tail bounds you study in class. What might be relevant here? We review the study till Wednesday is going to be very exciting. Sorry? Well, that is the A tail bone. That is correct, it is a tail bone. Whether it's relevant here or not, I don't know. So think about it this way. We have an algorithm which has a guaranteed expected running time. Expected t is equal to some ball number n. Right? And it's always correct. How do you convert this into a Monte Carlo algorithm where we say t is less than equal to some n of n? Which is a hard one of this. What would we do? All we have is a random variable that has a certain behavior on average time. How do we reason about this kind of extreme behavior? What is the widget that allows us to go from the expected value to extreme behavior? The widget is a tailbone. 
right? A tail bond tells us how likely it is that something deviates from its expected value by modulus or not, yes? I will come back to you slowly. So in this case, if I know the expected value is P of n, what kind of tool could I use to argue that it's unlikely to get to the value of P of n? What is a, a simple tool I could use? Do I know anything about the variance? From T, do I know anything about the variance? I don't even know the distribution. How am I going to do the variance? So I know the variance, what can I do? Even without the variance, there's something I can do. What can I do with the variance? Remember, your tail bonds are increasingly sophisticated weapons. But there's also a blood tax, which is blood test tax in your, in your toolkit here. To the reason about tail bonds. You don't need variance for that, yes? Uh, can you use sampling and then see how, like how often you use how these far away? Well, empirically, yes, but how do you prove? I mean, I, I'm asking for an algorithm, right? So what is your yeah. algorithm? You say sample, like what are you going to sample? You're going to sample T. Well, what does that mean? You have to run the algorithm a bunch of times. Okay, how many times do you run? It gets back to the same problem of trying to figure out how likely it is that your algorithm will deviate from its mean value. Without a variance bound, there's only so much you can do. But what can you do? Which is a tailbone that doesn't mean anything. There is one. Markov Markov. Yes, but how do you use it? What does the Markov inequality say? The probability that a random variable is anyone? Is less than uh, some concept back in terms of expectation of that variable. Not less than more more than. What's the problem here with Less than the expectation of the constant. Well, no, the way you said it is this. Okay. Can, we cancel out? Can I use this to convert from Las Vegas to Monte Carlo? Suppose I take my algorithm, which has an expected line time of P of n, I know this, <coughs> and I run it for three P of n steps, and just take whatever answer I get at that point. Or see if I got an answer to the point, and otherwise say I don't have an answer. What is the probability that algorithm will fail? The probability the algorithm will fail is the probability that the algorithm was going to take more than three p of n steps. What's the probability the algorithm will take more than three p of n steps? One over three. So, if you take this algorithm, run for three P of N steps and return answer you receive. And if you don't run, because of the mark of inequality, the probability of success, remember this algorithm is always correct. So if it stops, you get a correct answer, is greater than two over three. Because the probability of failure is less than one over three, which is exactly what you want. I feel there's still a lot of confusion about this in the book. What, what is confusing? Or what, oh, maybe you have the question ask us, are there places where, place where you don't you know, quite see how this reasoning is working? This is your time to ask for this kind of clarification because you know, you're not a time to consume. All clear? Okay. All right. And so our tail balls are increasingly powerful weapons that we can wield as long as we have more information. When we had no information, all we have is Markov. Markov requires that x is it requires that x is greater than or equal to zero, which is fine because running time is greater than or equal to zero, unless you're running your algorithm out in sort of a space-time manifold. Which you won't do here. Um, but if you have in other information about your random variable, like you're doing sampling, you look at your random variable, then you have things like variance, right? 
you have random independent trials, all independent random variables can be summed up, and the variance can be summed up, you have some more tools to your disposal. And then you can apply the championship model. Right? And I, in the assignment, I introduced this idea of what is called a churn up form, and I probably won't you know, push you too much on that, because we didn't talk about that too much in class, but we did at least ex expose that to an even more powerful kind of model. Right? And you know, if you do need to use it, I'll give you what you need to but that's the way you think about randomized algorithms. Either it's a Monte Carlo or Las Vegas, the way you design it. If it's a Monte Carlo, you need some procedure that you can reason about that says, okay, the probability of error is small. And the only way you can prove a probability of error is small is by looking at the expected error and then saying, okay, the probability of deviating too much from the expected value and the probability of deviating too much from that is going to be small by a real bond. So you have to think about how you're going to apply your championship bond to a problem. And you've done this in the assignments. Right? But you have to do this here as well. Okay. Um, let's continue. We once we finished talking about randomness, we went on to this idea of optimization. Right? And the whole idea of optimization was to take all these different problems and funnel them into a standard language. So that once you have a problem in a standard language, we can solve that problem in a canonical way, which allows us to solve all these other problems. So what are the key things you have to do to define an optimization problem? There are three steps to define an optimization problem. What are those steps? Identify the which constraints and object. Right. You need the variables, you need the constraints, <coughs> and you need the objective. And why were these choices of how you frame, and there are different ways you could do this for any problem. Why are those choices important? What do they affect in your result? So you end up with some optimization problem, right? But the choices you make in how to model them affect the, your ability to optimize. And can you give some examples of you know, how you need to choose constraints and objectives the right way to make this tractable? So we've talked about this a little bit, right? So I mean, under what conditions do you get something you can actually solve? Do you remember any of that? The variables needs to be continuous if you want a tractable solution. Well, at, at the very least, if they're not continuous, you're going to have problems. Yeah. You, you might have problems, yeah. right? So being continuous is good. OK, what else do we know? Convex objective. Convex objective is good. And what's a, what's an important special case of a convex objective? Mm -hmm. A linear objective is good, even better, right? OK, what else? What about the constraints? We didn't talk too much about constraints, but for the most part, you've done the linear constraints. And those are kind of easy to work with, right? So linear is good. And you're not really going to have to worry too much about nonlinear constraints and things like that. There are interesting problems if we have problems. Okay. And what is the, the sort of an important class of optimization problems that we spend a lot of time studying? The case where, what does it call it? A special form of this that we spend quite a bit of time with. Integer or linear program. I still look at linear programming and integer linear programming. And if you remember, we have this kind of geometric view of what a linear program looks like, right, which you spend a lot of time on. And what is that geometric? What is the? If you had to explain to someone what a linear programming problem is and explain it using geometry, because you couldn't write an algebra for them, so you want to draw a picture. How would you describe it? How would you describe what a linear programming problem looks like? What shape it has? Sorry? Either a bounded convex hull or so constraints. Bounded convex hull. That's a that's not something I well so constraints <laughs> would be very uh hyperplanes you were Okay. So constraint would be like hyperplanes in what's a hyperplane? It's like so things very flat, yeah. So lines if you will. Right? So it looks like this. And then what? Then you take the intersection of these constraints and your objective, and that's your feasible solution space. Well, not the objective, just the constraints. This is my feasible space, right? Yeah. And then the objective, the thing you're trying to find, will always be where? Right. It'll be on some boundary, on some boundary vertex, right? So your objectives will always be somewhere here. And where the objectives will depend on what? Yeah. And the direction of the objective. Right? So the direction of the objective will decide which way you have to go. So then in the linear programming problem, this is the picture you're looking at. And if you're doing integer linear programming, how does this picture change? 
How does this picture change if you have integer constraints? So, the solution will be on a grid. It will be on a grid. So you'll find the best answer on the grid, and some, some of the answers will be on the outside. So this is your, these are the possible solutions you can have, the rest are all the Right? Okay. And then, of course, we talked about this, because we said, you know, we have this geometry in our head, we can actually simplify what a linear program looks like algebra, because it's all equivalent, because of the geometry. And this canonical form of a linear program looks like what? He says something looks like this, maximize some linear function of my input. So you think of C as a vector, X as a vector, right? And we said all the constraints can be thought of as something is less than equal to something else. And if you stack them up, you get a matrix structure here. And you submit that. You may not have that, but you can. So this is a canonical representation of a linear program. It's canonical because if you want to minimize instead of maximize, you just need to flip a sign. If you want to say greater than equal to or less than equal to, you just need up some signs. But it still works. Okay? Okay. Why did we want to study linear programs for when, we, when actually you want to study integer programs? What is the advantage of doing that? What is the value of studying a linear program, but actually you want to study the integer program? How do we use that as part of our algorithm design process? We talked about this a bit, right? So we said, you know. If we're gonna maximize something, the best integer maximum value is something, the best linear max inter, uh, uh, optimization is something else. What can we say about, we can say that if we're maximizing, the LP solution is always greater than equal to the integer program solution, right? That's always true. And if it's minimizing, it's not better. But then what is the use of solving the linear program? It's always gonna be more, it's not real, right? It's not, what is the hope? What is the idea of how to solve the integer problem using the linear problem? What is our trick? Rounding. So what does rounding mean in this sense? What is the idea? We think the integer program deducts the constraints of values. On the variables? Yeah. You drop it out, yeah, and then? And once you find out the uh, point where you get uh, the maximum value, then by rounding we uh, find out the nearest integer value. Right, so by we hope to find an integer solution that's nearby. We don't guarantee to find the nearest, but we hope to find something that's nearby. And what is the good thing about finding a solution that's nearby? That means you can argue that the cost is not too much worse. Right, so if you start here and you end up here, I mean, that's not the best solution, but you can say, okay, it's not too bad. So the basic meta algorithm is model as integer program, relax to a linear program, solve linear program, and this is literally a black box, right? You just solve it, because we can solve it for a time, and then round the solution to be integral. And then hopefully you reason about why the integral solution you got is both feasible and is close to the original solution. So feasibility is important, right? If you round it the wrong way, you may end up with an infeasible solution. So you must show that it's both feasible and high quality. Okay? So again, in the spirit of what you need to prove, these are things you need to prove. Right? So this part, so first you need to show that this modeling is correct. This needs a proof. Right? That if you model it, a solution here, a solution there, and so on. Then this part is kind of automatic. You just say, okay, we relax it to an linear program. Our variable is still being 0, 1, they're between 0 and 1, and you solve it. And then you have to prove it. Okay, so there's what a complete proof for a rounding algorithm. Okay. And then the final thing we looked at when we looked at linear program was we looked at the idea of the dual of the So we said, oh, if there's a program, max C transpose X, such that AX is less than or equal to B, and X greater than equal to zero, 
by reasoning about, by trying to figure out whether a solution we got is in fact optimal. We got some x, it satisfies the constraints, we don't know what's optimal. We tried to reason about the best upper bound we could get or best value we could get for anything by showing that there's some value beyond which this cannot go. And then the process of searching for that best bound beyond which it cannot go is a minimization problem because you're, you're maxing them here and you're minimizing from there. And that looks like this. Minimize y transpose b, y transpose a is greater than equal to c, y is greater than equal to zero. And each variable in y, y being a vector, corresponds to one constraint of x. Each variable in x corresponds to one constraint of y. And the, the theorem of strong duality said that basically c transpose x star is equal to y um, star transpose b if both LPs are bounded. They're not bounded, it's not bounded. Right? If one goes to three, it's a number. But if they're both bounded and actually have a solution, then the max of one is the minimum of the other. They match it. And then we saw how this applies, for example, in the case of flows and cuts. Max flow is equal to min cut. Yes? So that's kind of a very high speed overview of a lot of things we covered in the latter half, latter portion of the class. Um, Again, with an emphasis on things you need to worry about what you have to prove versus not. And the concepts it's important to keep in your mind. Yes, so we are about, especially with things like table models, it can be a little confusing. So we have five minutes left. <laughs> Any questions? No, it's not A4. This is the US, US letter size. Letter size paper. There, one of that. Okay. You want to write five point micro form? Yeah, it's up to you. <laughs> as long as you can read it, I don't care. Yeah, but uh, that's not all you can. So I would, I would suggest you, well, it's up to you. You can write it or you can lay check it or whatever you want. It should be things that you think will be helpful to keep in mind. Like I said, table balls might be useful to keep in mind. Right? Um, Basic references might be helpful to keep the mouse theorem, just a reminder of the mouse theorem, which might be helpful to keep in mind. Um, some reminders to yourself, okay, for this kind of problem, this is what I need to do to prove it, that might be helpful. Right? Uh, the mechanics of duality might be helpful, again, up to you. Um, what else do we have? Just going through the topics of the class. Again, for things like, okay, you know, if you want optimization, the model follows the thing, what things you need to keep in mind, how you write, you know. Again, these are just memory sort of things. We, in a, in a 50 minute exam, even the questions are going to be of a certain kind. Right? They're not going to be, for example, very long questions we think for a long time. That won't work. So they're going to be of a certain kind, which means you, the answer can be found quickly, but then the assist might not be. So you come in and so look at your sheets and make sure you will be the sheets not the one that you won't have your left put your device still in or be working on this small one. So that's just what we But the cheese is up to you. Everyone, you know, everyone might have their own things. Some might feel, okay, I, I know my table, but I'm going to real estate of that, but I need to write something else down. Some might feel, okay, I know those things I need to write down, but everything else is fine. It's, it's really a personal choice. Based on, based on the blank pieces today, I would teach you about writing those things. The weightage of the day for my is equal to the weightage of the cloud, or is it not? That's um, that's what I had in mind. So in other words, you can take home exams not be a lot longer in terms of just amount of time. Uh, well, I give you more time to take home exam, but um, yeah. And you're still planning on ending up to take home exam once day. That's I think what I said. I would do. Yeah. Okay. Are we turning that in online or? Yeah, we'll upload it. Like okay. the assignments. So. Okay. Russ, you mentioned that you would provide some more yep. detailed graph learning project. Yes, I, I was going to upload it last night, and I forgot it. I'll do it right now. It's just a latent template. Oh, okay. just stop there. For the assignments, is this to do the, the best of five? Yes. So, I'll just go on that. Okay. Um, one minute left. Any last minute questions? What's your favorite coffee shirt?
<laughs> What's my favorite coffee shirt? That's a good question. I like this one a lot. This, this is, is not a coffee, coffee shirt. I know. I'm just saying. I like it a lot. So let's see. I have the. Uh, I like the no coffee, no talk. Because that, some people just not talk to me, and this is exactly what I want. So that's a good one. Um, I like the coffee. My spirit animal always gets me a lot of joy. Yeah. Um, what else do I have? Uh, it's always time. Good time for coffee is my personal life philosophy. I have very <coughs> principles in life with this one. That whenever someone asks for the coffee, I go. So even if I just had it two minutes ago. Um, uh, any more? Okay, you don't have nice coffee shirts. Branded. Sorry? You have some nice coffee branded shirts. I do have one. Just one, okay. From Kiba Coffee House, which is the, the most amazing coffee house ever. Have you, have you ever been to Southern Utah? Uh, Escalante, where the slot canyons are? There's this drive called the Hell's Backbone Drive. It's a very, very pleasant drive. No, it's not actually. It's basically, it's like a highway, you know, something falls on sheer cliffs on both sides. And you drive the dark, it's a bit more fun. So anyway, so if you drive on the highway towards Escalante, there is, um, at some point, there is a cliff, and there's a building there, and that's a coffee house, coffee shop. It's called Kiva Coffee House. And so you go inside, they have you know, amazing food, or you can have your lunch and dinner or whatever, but they have the best coffee. And you take your coffee and you can sit in there and you sleep on the canyon edge. You can sit there and look into the canyon. It's, one, it's probably the best coffee house ever made. In terms of just quality of coffee and the friends. So that's that's the only coffee house I'm looking for. That's the only shirt I have. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I will see you all on Wednesday. Good luck.